every, in every situation where their dignity is reaffirmed, that's very important for them. And uh, they take very crowded buses, they take crowded trains, so they sometimes take two hours to get to, this, to the job, so it's a very, very tough life. And so when they are treated in a very com comfortable way, you know, this is, exceeds their expectations, so this is very important. Uh, Brazil is a multiracial country, uh, about half of Brazilians are considered whites, and half, and the other half are considered non-whites, and this, the non-whites is a mixture of all colors, all races, Indians, Africans of all shades, and so there is a prejudice with darker people. The darker you get, uh, you have maybe get a bit more difficulty in getting jobs, you know, the jobs are more easily uh, got by lighter skinned people. So, uh, this, all this adds to this inferiority complex, you know, to the low income consumers because most of, low, most of the darker people are lower income. And so, uh, the successful retailers are the ones who reaffirm. And uh, there are many very successful ones who will do this. Uh, I'm going to just uh, mention uh, this, uh, there, uh, this is common words, you know, which you see, I'm poor but I'm clean, you know, say, uh, who, you know, why do you say this? I'm poor but I'm honest, you know, uh, because, uh, because there is drug traffic in the slums, uh, the police sometimes stops people uh, to see if they are carrying drugs uh, or carrying weapons. This doesn't have happen with, you know, the upper scale, but so they are, have this, uh, sometimes this threatened to be, you know, stopped by the police. So when they say, I'm, a, I'm poor, but I am honest, say, well, I don't belong to that minority which, you know, uh, you were after it. Uh, I just gave you, a, bring an example, an interesting example. I was talking to Jean, uh, coming here. It's a, company in Brazil called Beleza Natural is a beauty parlor chain, of a chain of beauty parlors. They have now about a thousand employees. And what, was the, what makes this unique is that uh, the lady who found it was a slum, it lived in Shantytown, and she didn't like her hair, you know, because she was a black afro, and she tried different products to smooth the hair and to do things with her. And then she got a bit tired of this and say, well, let's be, uh, be proud of my type of hair and let me uh, make it even prettier, you know, uh, take advantage of the curly which I naturally have. So this uh, beauty parlor has these uh, huge lines of people going in. They are huge places, very well done, you know, and the message is, you know, you are beautiful as you are and let's make you prettier. And with the, cur the hair, let's make it even more, more attractive. So this uh, uh, successful story of people of, of self, you know, affirming their, okay, so they are pretty girls. This is an example of this, some of the beauty parlors, so how they big they are. They have a very efficient process uh, uh, of treating. They are like a production line. You sit one place, you wash your hand, then you move, you go to other place where you're treated, and so it's, uh, uh, and they, they enjoy this very much, the lower income consumers. And it's, uh, I think they are going to franchising. Uh, they are very smart, though, two girls. Uh, one is taking a course in Harvard, you know, to upgrade. The, she is a constant speaker, lecturer in many, you know, uh, events. And uh, trust is a similar, you know, uh, as a self-esteem. Uh, and companies which show this trust to consumers, uh, for example, we have a store, a chain of store like uh, called uh, Day Percent. The Day Percent is a, a format, a small format developed by Carrefour. Carrefour is a French, a large French uh, retailer, and they are small retailers like uh, Audi type store. 
but uh, the policy is that they should, uh, they have a very aggressive uh, surveillance of people, you know, and so there are big guards look at people, and this, you know, uh, kills all the trust, destroy, you know, the desire for the consumers to go in there because they say, well, uh, I go here and I don't feel that people trust me, you know, I am not going to be here. And uh, so, some examples what low income consumers resent. <coughs> uh, they resent things like this, you know, uh, if attendance is very close, you know, if you go and there is a attendant uh, walking behind. Uh, seal bags, if you go in the store and they ask, you know, put your bags here, you can't go in with the bag, let's seal your bags before you go <coughs> in. Even revolving doors, you know, something, if you go in the bank and there is a revolving door in the bank for protection, they feel annoyed. Uh, if they ask, are asking for uh, uh, debt, uh, credit, and people say, I want to show, prove me how, how much do you earn. You know, let's see your income. Uh, and that uh, shows that you are not trusting what I'm saying. Uh, what's your address? Now this, show me, you know, I want to see that your address is really this, show me, a, you know, a bill account or so, uh, ID, you know, people in Brazil often ask IDs. So there are successful companies who don't do this, you know. They, okay, this, this suspicious consumer, okay, I am say they have a discredit for companies who don't uh, make this relationship <laughs> well. And one of the companies, very successful, in affirming this trust is called Casas Bahia. Casas Bahia is a very interesting case. It was a German uh, Jew which flew from Nazi uh, camp and somehow he managed to, flew to, to escape. And he went to Brazil and he founded this uh, way to sell uh, things to the poor uh, people. And Casas Bahia is now at a uh, huge uh, business, $10 billion a year, very uh, the largest appliance retailer in Brazil. And their philosophy is trust, you know, trust, trust, and uh, respect. They, uh, they train their employees, you know, if they go for credit, uh, don't check if your ID, you know, like driver's license, uh, if the picture matches with the person, they are specially trained not to do this, you know. If someone comes for a TV and say, well, I'd like a TV, you say, okay, come. And the f first TV they show are the, is the most expensive one, you know. Uh, so in a one way to see, well, you know, uh, I believe you can do it. You know, I, I don't think that you, you know, I'm not uh, minimizing your status. And then the consumer say, you know, that's too much. And they are trained to say, well, one day you will be able to buy it. You know, and the credit scoring is very unique. This is an example of a store. Uh, they say appliance, furniture. And uh, one aspect is that out of every 100 customers, around 70% have no proof of income. Okay, you say, how much do you earn? Well, I am a taxi driver, or, you know, I am, and oh, I, 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 am in the, I sell vegetables in the open market. They, and so it's okay, you know, uh, we trust you. And so uh, they build this re trust relationship and they are very well liked by the consumers. Uh, abundance is another, you know, very important uh, uh, value. Somehow, you know, there is low income consumers living in scarcity and so they used to live in scarcity, maybe that sometimes they didn't have enough food, you know, money to, to buy food, so they want things in abundance to, uh, to make them away, you know, from that uh, thoughts of scarcity. So uh, there is a lot of over, you know, over statement, extravagance, like carnival, you know, bright colors, uh, so, and also the visual merchandise in respond to this, uh, the, the amount of products, uh, consumer, low income consumers like to go in the supermarket and they see, you know, uh, products stack up to the ceiling. Uh, this gives them a feeling that they are 
treated you know, in a place where there is enough you know, products to them. And uh, you know, there's a simple uh, lot of products you know, in <laughs> display uh, compared to, this is another uh, example of abundance. You see a lot of uh, massive merchandising. You know, this goes up to ceilings. So these are examples of how to deal with them in a way which matches their uh, their uh, their desires, their expectations, their unconscious uh, perceptions. Okay, this is an example of not to do, you know, with the low-income consumers. And this is a famous big chain, European chain, gone to Brazil to serve the low-income consumers, and they are very, uh, they, they don't do well at all. You know, they have a low, uh, lower price than the competitors. But they look at the store, you know, so so uh, not abundant, you know, <coughs> it's empty, you know, uh, must be old products probably. Okay, this is very much again in contrast with the upper scale which want exclusive products, okay. Uh, another, okay, that's also strong lighting is one part of this statics in general. Consumers, uh, stores have a very uh, strong lightening, you know, maybe to, to brighten the atmosphere. Uh, another way also is this uh, aspirational needs and the difference between low-income consumers and upper-income consumers. The upper class, you know, they want products, exclusive products. You know, the, if you, s you, you want to buy to be different, you want to be unique in general. Uh, so consumers want to differentiate from mass market, but the low income consumers is the opposite. They want to be part of the mass consumption. So all the advertising for the low income consumers is that say, well, you, ca you, you, can, you also you can afford it. You, know? uh, you can also do it. Uh, it's also for you. Uh, so it's a different uh, type of uh, messages which must be adjusted. Uh, not saying that they are poor, but they say, well, you can really, you know, be, uh, their aspirations is to be middle class. So uh, they don't aspire to be upper class, they aspire to be middle class. And so the message is in this direction. Uh, this is an example of a butcher store you know, for low-income consumers. So you have marble floors, you know, and this helps the aspirational needs, but at the same time, they have a very no exclusive signing, you know, it's, uh, it's massive signing, massive products. So it's interesting combination of abundance and at the same time, nice equipment. Uh, this is a very successful chain of uh, store called Marisa, they have about 300 stores all over Brazil. It's like a department store uh, for clothes, very <coughs> much geared to women. And the stores are very nice, you know, and the very, very, uh, but it's massive. The, the advertising is very strong. And they, the consumers feel that they are, you know, getting better. They are uh, going up the status their social status when they go to shop there. Another interesting case is Habib's. Habib's is the major competitor of McDonald's <laughs> in Brazil. And they feel sometimes they match, you know, the aspiration of the low income consumers. The low income consumers when they go out every, you know, once a month or so, every, uh, they like to sit, they like to be served, you know, the, the whole life they serve. And when they have some money, they like to be served. So they want to sit, they want the waiter to come, you know, and so this, uh, the, sometimes this really <laughs> self-service idea, you know, for like a, a McDonald's, but McDonald's is a bit more expensive, but McDonald's has doors, you know, they are not open. Uh, so it's an uh, interesting way to adjust to them. Uh, another way is ease of access, you know, there's a, uh, a district downtown, uh, major unplanned shopping area, uh, and many of the stores have, uh, you know, merchandise in the street, in the sidewalk. 
You know, people walk and almost bump in the clothes, in the products, and so it's one pattern which you will never see in a sophisticated store. You know, the sophisticated store it doesn't show this. It uh, wants you to, to go in the store. You know, so you see some of the products you know, in the store almost in the sidewalk. You know, sometimes you have even you know, small kiosks you know, in the street. Uh, <coughs> this is a, that market, supermarket I took the photographs on, this one, you know, Nagumo. And you see how Nagumo is right on the sidewalk, you know, and the, car, the trolley, the carts to shop, they are in the middle of the sidewalk. You know. uh, they don't have much space, but this is also to, you know, to show that, you know, they are there. Uh, opposite to Walmart, which is next door in front of Nagumo. You see, the location is not appropriate for low-income consumers because they are out from the sidewalk, so people uh, have to walk, and this is a place where ideal for cars. You see? So they have to walk where the cars go to, so you will remind them that they are poor. So, this, uh, so, so there are some subtleties you know, in this uh, perception, which now we are beginning to become more conscious. Uh, there are two major types of places where you shop uh, for no food. Uh, uh, either you go to shopping centers, which are more upper scale, or you go to unplanned shopping districts. Okay, so <coughs> they are those two alternatives. This is a picture of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is in a huge city, about 11 million people. And it's interesting to see that uh, the blue sections are the upper scale, and it's rather, you know, structure. Uh, as you go uh, on the s peripheries, they are lower, uh, lower income. So it's a, a bit different than here, you know. But downtown, closer area, they are have higher income. And here, uh, the stars are where the shopping centers are, and the circles are where the that business districts are. And the business district, the shopping districts are, are big. Sometimes they are larger than shopping centers. They may ha might have a close to a thousand stores. Or they are in traffic uh, terminals next to terminal of bus or trains, and they really serve the low-income consumers. So here are some examples, but uh, you will not make much uh, meaning from that. Uh, this is an interesting map exercise we did, mapping all the stores in those. Uh, big unplanned shopping areas. You see how, how big they are. There are about 700 stores in this one and they spread to many streets and uh, they sometimes have a street which is all fashion. Some other streets are, uh, so they are very uh, demanded for the low income consumers who don't have cars. Okay, this is an uh, example of you know, uh, what they look like. Because why is there again. Another uh, look at those uh, unplanned business districts, okay. and uh, okay, and also they have a, there is a, a gap in communication between you know the what they need and the executives of companies, uh, executive of companies, directors of uh, of uh, marketing, they come from well you know educated schools. Uh, they are uh, distant from the mindset of the low-income consumers. Uh, they have to <laughs> learn how to communicate, and one very strong uh, procedure is to have them go and live one week in a house, a low-income house. Okay, so there are companies who, marketing research companies who are uh, make this, uh, making this happen. And uh, friends of mine who have done this, you say, you know, it's, it's amazing how much we learn, you know, the habits, how they, you know, they can stretch the money, and they come with a different mindset, and they are able to communicate more. And uh, we are beginning to hire people from the lower income areas, so we had to have education because they sometimes can help the companies communicate. So there is this. Uh, the gaps in values, culture, education, economic, uh, and racial too, uh, compared to uh, 
sometimes the upper scale in Brazil have a sort of aristocratic co uh, complex. You know, they, uh, if they put a store, they want the store to serve the more upper scale. It's not very, uh, people don't think about opening business for the low income consumers, but now it's changing, you know, people see the opportunity. And uh, so this is a uh, thing which is changing uh, gradually. Uh, with uh, as, uh, along with the increase of uh, income, but also with the, with the increase of income, people begin to see the huge market there is, and they begin to really uh, want to understand this market. Okay, uh, I, uh, this is you know what I had to say. I, don't, I think I, I don't want to extend yeah. it. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I picked the, the other presentation. I made a mistake. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yeah. Forenti. I know that some of you may have some questions, okay. or you may not have any questions. You may be hungry by now, or maybe not. So I'm going to open up to some questions. Uh, as you can see, this is a demonstration of uh, what uh, C.K. Prahalad from the University of Michigan used to talk about the bottom of the pyramid. Selling to the bottom of the pyramid was a, a, a publication, in fact, I think it was a book. Yeah, it was a book. It's a book. Because by years the case, yeah. That's right. Very successful in marketing. And so, uh, just to give, uh, you know, Dr. Parente also talked a little bit about the BRIC countries, but uh, think about the BRIC countries like this. You've got uh, probably five major countries or four major countries in the BRIC countries. Uh, these are large countries, uh, like uh, in terms of geography, in terms of land mass, the number one country in the world, as you know, is Russia. Number two is uh, uh, Canada. Number three is China. Number four is the U.S. And number five is Brazil. In terms of population, things get reversed. You've got China's number one, number two, uh, India, very much uh, uh, similar. And then you have, uh, then you have uh, the U.S. with uh, 320 million. You know, China with 1.3 billion. Uh, India 1.2 billion, uh, US was 320, and then we've got uh, uh, countries like Indonesia with 260, Brazil with 200, so these are very large masses, large populations and growing very fast. An opportunity for, in a, a lot of these countries like Dr. Parento was talking about, a large proportion <coughs> of the population are poor and they're middle class or, or lower classes, uh, socioeconomically speaking. So I'm going to stop here now and ask uh, whether you have any questions, Dr. Parenti. Uh, yes, one up there. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a tech cancer, uh, uh, accounting major. Uh, okay. I have a general question. Um, uh, how easy is it for a uh, for someone to start a small business in Brazil? Um, in other words, what, what, how big is the how big is the uh, is the uh, is the uh, entrepreneur class? Uh, entrepreneur is very high. Uh, the there is a lot of informal business. Uh, the formality are a bit uh, uh, tough in Brazil. Brazil has a lot of bureaucracy to open up uh, companies. Uh, uh, fortunately, we are beginning to change this, but uh, probably to open up a company sometimes can take months for you to open up. So what uh, often happens, people partner with already companies which are existing to make this more easily, uh, but the informal economy is very, very high. And the entrepreneurship among the informal, you know, people who don't open the business but they have a business which is not official, this is very, very high. And the government is now beginning to, to make this easier, you know, to have a taxi, how you pay taxes more, more easily. But as a place, I think we have to, to make many advances on this. We are a bit behind, <coughs> but the entrepreneurial spirit of the people is very, very high. Okay. I, I did see who asked that. Uh, let's okay. raise your okay. hand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions uh, that you may have? If you want to add, you know, uh, 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 Dean uh, Sartarelli probably knows more about Brazil because he has this wide experience in many, many countries which are similar in uh, in different stages, then he would have an excellent uh, idea of comparison too. Right, and, uh, and one of the reasons we, we're bringing lectures like Dr. Parenti and executives and uh, CEOs is that I see, I see education as part of a process where you're exposed, you get education from your parents, from your friends, from your professors, from the books, from the internet, 
and also from role models, from looking at people who have succeeded in life in different uh, endeavors. And so he's an example of a successful, uh, not only a professor, but a business executive also. And so I think it's, uh, it's by role modeling that people you know, learn. And so that's, uh, and, and many times uh, these individuals also bring a lot of knowledge and experience. And one of the things we're also trying to do is to expand our program so that we will have connectivity both at the undergraduate program and the graduate program with countries around the world. Uh, my aspiration is from someday, both undergraduates and graduates, that if you want to have uh, some time in Germany or, or Italy or Brazil or China or India in the future or in the Middle East uh, or South Africa, uh, that we pro uh, provide you the opportunity to do so. I think uh, this global uh, market of today, this economy that's so interconnected, will require executives and, and people, professionals with a knowledge of, uh, uh, of the global market uh, more than ever before. Uh, the U.S. is a very important market, continues to be a very important market, but when you go from a situation where the U.S. market <coughs> today is about 14 uh, million uh, cars, for instance, and China is just slightly bigger in terms of number of vehicles. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, I think the business school has to provide you a not look on life that's not just uh, constrained by one, the borders of us, uh, just the U.S., but you have to be thinking globally because some of you, you, you may spend a good part of your lives uh, uh, working overseas uh, in, in the mm -hmm. future. But any other questions that you uh, may want to ask uh, or may have? Uh, and I hope this is useful because what we're trying to do is to provide you new sources of uh, knowledge and and experiences and share those with you. Uh, the professors have any questions? Uh, the professors seem to be quiet and, and reserved. Yes, uh, Scott. How does West Virginia compare to Brazil when you look at that consumer pyramid? Well, I well, I I don't know the I didn't do it my homework you know too well before <laughs> coming here so, so I apologize for this <laughs> and but uh, you know certainly it's it's a huge difference you know because uh, probably we were talking yesterday that most of the adults go to high school went to high school here you know and this makes a huge difference already and uh, your per capita income must be you know five times higher than ours in brazil you know west virginia so this is a huge difference too uh, and probably you know what you find that you were poor people they would be middle class standards in brazil so you know the reference is different uh, so it's you know a huge uh, huge gap you know still so you're much much better off you know than in Brazil, you know, maybe pr probably five times more, you know, in income. <coughs> so it's a huge difference. Right, and just to give you a comparison, if you think of New Jersey, which is my other state, uh, New Jersey, the average per capita income is about almost $60,000, which is the either number one, number two uh, against Connecticut. Connecticut's about $63,000. West Virginia is about $34,000, about half of what New Jersey is. And Brazil is about uh, nine, 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 ten thousand. So you've got sixty-three thousand in New Jersey, about thirty-four thousand in West Virginia, and you've got about nine thousand in Brazil. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have market potential. One thing I learned at Michigan State, as my professor market used to tell me, is like a market is people with money willing to buy. People with money willing to buy. When you have a lot of people with no money and willing to buy, you don't have a market. You have a mob. Right? So you don't sell to mobs. You, you want people with money to willing to buy. So what is happening in the emerging markets is that you have the people very much willing to buy, but they, haven't had not, they have not had money. With the economic, fast economic <coughs> development, all of a sudden, they're coming to money. So that's a great combination. That's why these markets are starting to explode in terms of sizes. And, and one of the challenges that, uh, like uh, I was working for J&J &J or worked for other companies, is like in China or Brazil, is how, how, do we reach, how do we reach with our products the lower uh, socioeconomic uh, classes? The, not the A's and B's, because those are well served and we can communicate with them, we can sell them to them very well. But what about the, B, uh, the C's and D's and E's, those socioeconomic classes which are not very affluent, uh, they don't know how to read very well, how do you end up selling your products to them? That's the challenge that uh, a business person is faced with. Any other question from any other uh, professor or student? Yeah, yes, yeah, ma'am. Hi. You show the pictures of Walmart. Does yeah. Walmart serve a different uh, market in Brazil than in the U.S.? Uh, 
Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I would say that, uh, the, well, in Brazil they have hypermarket, which you don't really quite have here, you know, this, the format in Brazil is slightly different, uh, but some club is the same, ex exactly the same, and the <coughs> Walmart uh, hypermarket, they sell middle to up uh, scale. And now they are beginning in the Northeast to develop a, a format, which I think they would be very successful. Uh, which is, you know, like Audi type, but uh, larger with more service. But not only this, there are community uh, areas in the store. So there is a clinic in the store which the Walmart is supporting. There is a place where you can get your documents, you know, your uh, driver, not the driver license, but your ID card or your uh, working permit. And so they are trying to, to really uh, settle down and make a model which I think they will be very successful. They, uh, the companies do a great job in corporate responsibility. I, it, uh, I want to show you a film that was in Portuguese, how, you know, how, what Walmart does uh, in corporate responsibility.